Helping people tell their stories is at the core of what I do as a psychologist. Today, I'm going to start by telling you a story. Adam was the type of person that people found really easy to talk to. He was that guy in school who knew instinctively how to be empathetic and support people in need. He naturally followed a pathway into a helping profession and trained to be a mental health social worker. In his first week on the ward, he was all full of energy. He was excited. He couldn't wait to use his skills in connecting with people. Adam was the one who sat for hours with Femi when he first arrived on the ward. Scared and confused, it was Adam's kind presence and big smile that helped Femi feel seen and cared for. Weeks into the job, and Adam starts to notice the traits of his colleagues. His manager never takes time off and always works long hours. Although she tells Adam to go home on time, her behavior gives the message that to succeed, he needs to be willing to give more of himself to the work. His colleagues never take lunch and are always complaining about how overworked they are. And he's saddened as he sees many of them working from a place of disconnection and the insensitive ways that they talk about and treat the people on the ward. He worries that one day he may have to become so disconnected himself. Time goes on and he's starting to feel the pressure. He's getting less sleep, constantly rushing from appointment to appointment, never feeling that he has enough time to exercise the very skills that got him into the work. It starts to have an impact on him. He's taking time off work for ill health and chronic stress, and eventually, he feels he has to leave his job. Stories like Adam, they may be familiar to more, many of you. In fact, they become so familiar that in many lines of work, they're expected. I recognize much of my own experience in Adam's story. In fact, in the early stages of my career, I also found myself on an inpatient ward. Often, I'd return to my office in tears. I was deeply affected by the ways that I saw my colleagues working from a place of disconnection. Many of the people on the ward had had extreme life circumstances or had experienced childhood trauma, and it hurt to see how they were cruelly they were talked about and treated. I spent the last 10 years of my career asking myself the question, why? Why do good people who can be so humane to each other and to their families end up treating people who are vulnerable as if they are products rather than people? I've come to the belief that one of the many reasons are due to the things that cause and maintain burnout culture. There are decades of studies of so-called burnout, but what so many of these studies do is individualize the issue of burnout. They make it into a phenomena that happens to one match at a time, and the solutions are focused at one individual at a time. There's this idea that all we have to do is get workers to look after themselves, be more boundaried, you know, just don't work so hard. But you can't solve this issue one individual at a time. It's like putting out a single match when really you're standing in a forest fire. This culture is in all of our frontline services, and it's going to take all of us to change it. Social workers like Edem are likely to burn out within eight years. 91% of social workers report high to moderate levels of emotional exhaustion. And these statistics focus on social work, but the same could be said in many other forms of work with marginalized people. In my profession, psychology, for example, in medicine, care work, activism, community work, teaching, the list goes on. Many of these issues are central to our understanding of what it means to help. There's this unwritten understanding that it's just a part of the job. There's this idea that those who give support are full cups and need to empty all of their resource into the empty cups of the needy. It's an old model of care that has some of its roots in charity and colonial missionary work. In those models, there were those who went to help the needy. They went from a place of moral superiority, and they had an urgent and righteous mission to change the circumstances of those that were seen as less than. In our modern iteration of these models, people can work tirelessly for those in need. Not only is this model unsustainable, it's a model that both harms those who are expected to give unending resource and those who are dehumanized in the assumption that they're empty of resource. Our tendency to ignore our own needs 
It shows up in many other areas of our lives. It actually makes me think about the profound messaging on the standard safety procedure of a flight. We often miss it, distracted by our uh, fear or excitement about the flight ahead. But it's a deeply profound idea that in the event of emergency, we need to make sure that we put on our own oxygen mask first before putting anybody else's on. It says something about an element of human nature that we sometimes forget ourselves when faced with somebody in need. When I hear these safety announcements, I think to myself, yeah, it makes sense. But I can't say how easy I would find it, flying with my daughter and faced with an emergency situation. I hope that I'll remember to put on my own mask, that by putting my mask on, I can more likely ensure both of our lives. Our images of the heroic form around the idea of people who sacrifice their needs for the good of another. We use the terminology of frontline worker. It comes from military language. And it's like we have this expectation that workers are in combat and need to be willing to put their lives on the line for others. Of course, there are those who don't try to avoid burnout, basically, and they ignore how they feel and they disconnect from the work. You know, it's just a job, after all. But I believe that this disconnection harms. Even the most dedicated and empathetic practitioner may find at times that they need to approach their work from a more objective and distant position, often working with people who are full of emotion and pain. We feel like we have to be a bit more distant from them. Sometimes we're exhausted and we feel like we need to disconnect from our bodies. Sometimes we just don't feel like we have the resource to be deeply present with the people that we're working with. But I believe that this disconnection harms everyone involved. It's from this disconnection that it becomes easier for us to dehumanize each other. Some of what I'm saying, it might be hard to hear. There may be some of you who are saying, well, yeah, but not me. Not my job, not my work, I can't. I get it. I've had those conversations myself. N no one of us is the source of the problem. And no one has got all the answers. But I do believe if we're ever going to change burnout culture, we need to be willing to fully confront it. I'm not saying there's never any place for heroics in the form of sacrifice for the needs of another. But the difference is that for many frontline workers, those, those sacrifices are constant. It's not just about jumping in front of a bus that one time to save somebody. People can get stuck working longer hours every day, constantly working even when they're unwell themselves. This form of heroic that is chronic and inflexible, it's deadly for the hero. We've seen in the COVID pandemic the terrible consequences of the failure to provide protective equipment for those who work to save the lives of so many. Even when faced with urgent situations, people are not supported and given the structures that they need. Many of the health professions and allied services were already overstretched and heavily impacted by burnout culture. In COVID, we see such an example of how our models of care fail to take care of the people that care. And the consequences, they're terrible for all of us. We've also seen in COVID an example of just how interconnected we are. When one person in the world becomes sick, we're all affected. Any gaps in our public health services can have tragic global effects. Returning to Adam's story. Some of you who are listening to his story might imagine that the reason he became so exhausted and eventually had to leave his job was due to the behaviours of his colleagues and his manager. But it's not really about them. It's about an institutional system that runs from a model of deficit. For example, Femi. Adam supported his discharge out of the hospital, but he went home to an unstable housing situation. He became homeless, which increased the likelihood that he's likely to be admitted to hospital again. It's these multiple systems that fail to meet the basic needs of the people that we work with not enough housing and few forms of employment that are really responsive to those with mental health needs. For me, the problem has never really been the people I work with or the pain they've been in. For me, it's been witnessing the marginalization, inequality and oppression on the lives of so many. I've been exhausted by that feeling 
than trying to fill a bucket-sized cup with a teaspoon, while other systems keep punching holes in the bottom. So what do we do about it? There's no easy, neat, step-by-step -step answers to how we resolve this issue. But one of the ways that we can all change is by altering our perception of what it means to give help. We need to deeply dissolve the boundary between those who help and those who are helped. One of the best kept secrets about my job is that actually it's a give and take relationship. It's not that you get the satisfaction of helping people in need. I've learned so much from the many people I've had the pleasure of working with. Their wisdom, bravery and inventiveness have taught me so much about human nature, about my own nature. I've learned about other knowledge systems, that medicine, science and psychology don't have all the answers. And each of the people I've worked with has an expertise of experience and skills and knowledge that are as deep and as significant as my own. We need to acknowledge that the boundary between helper and helped is actually fluid and temporary. I've seen just how fluid and temporary that boundary can be in my own life, moving from the position of supporter to someone who needed support. Through extreme fatigue and chronic pain, I had to find the grace to ask for help and receive it. I had to learn that my worth was more than what I could do. And I was fortunate. I saw my intrinsic worth mirrored back to me by the community around me. My experience of disability, illness and health have given me a deep insight into one of the fundamental truths that human beings are a profoundly interdependent species. We need each other. No cup is full and no cup is empty. One of the core messages of this talk has been about disconnection and how it can harm the people that we work with. I believe we really need to look at disconnection and to address it, we need to be willing to be vulnerable. We need to be willing to ask ourselves difficult questions. We need to be willing to give ourselves honest answers. Why do we disconnect? Why do we ignore our own needs? And how can we be more present? We really need to start reimagining what it means to be a hero. Heroes ask for help when they need it. Heroes fight for more just systems that fully resource those who need support. Heroes take time off. Heroes prioritize rest, healing, and resourcing themselves. Heroes don't have to strive alone, but are surrounded by communities that value them and the work they do. There are heroics in both giving and receiving care. In our moments of need of vulnerability, it takes courage to truly receive care. We all need that courage if we're ever going to imagine that anything else is possible and to truly reimagine what it means to give and receive health and care.